Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Dan Novak, Jill Robbins, Anna Mateo, and Kelly Jean Kelly. Dan brings us news about how the James Webb Space Telescope is helping astronomers learn more about when and how large galaxies first form. Then Jill Robbins has this week's education tip. She tells us how teachers can create a number of lessons from just one video. Ana Mateo comes next with this week's episode of Words and Their Stories. People who like birds will definitely want to listen to this story. And finally, Kelly Jean Kelly closes the program with our series, America's Presidents. She discusses the military leader who would become the first president. That's George Washington. And now, here's Dan Novak. Astronomers have discovered what appear to be huge galaxies dating back to within 600 million years of the Big Bang. The findings suggest the early universe may have quickly produced these extremely large galaxies. The new James Webb Space Telescope has seen even older galaxies, dating to within 300 million years of the beginning of the universe. But it is the size and maturity of these six galaxies that excite scientists. Ivo Labay of Australia's Swinburne University of Technology was the lead researcher. He and his team expected to find little galaxies this close to the beginning of the universe, not these very large ones. He said most galaxies at that time are still small and slowly grow over time. But there are a few monsters that fast-track to maturity. Why this is the case, or how this would work, is unknown. Each of the six objects looks to weigh billions of times more than our sun. In one of them, the total weight of all its stars may be as much as 100 billion times greater than our sun, the scientists found. They recently published their findings in the journal Nature. Yet these galaxies are believed to be very compact. They have as many stars as our own Milky Way, but in a relatively small area in space, Labay said. Labé said he and his team did not think the results were real at first. They thought there could not be galaxies as mature as the Milky Way so early in time. The objects appeared so big and bright that some members of the team thought they had made a mistake. Pennsylvania State University's Joel Legia, who took part in the study, calls them universe breakers. The finding that massive galaxy formation began extremely early in the history of the universe appends what many of us had thought was settled science, Lee just said in a statement. It turns out we found something so unexpected it actually creates problems for science. It calls the whole picture of early galaxy formation into question. These galaxy observations were among the first data that came from the $10 billion Webb Telescope. The telescope, from NASA and the European Space Agency, was launched just over a year ago to replace the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Hubble is approaching its thirty-third year of service. Webb is bigger and more powerful than Hubble. It can see through clouds of dust with its infrared vision, and discover galaxies previously unseen. Scientists hope to eventually observe the first stars and galaxies formed, following the creation of the universe thirteen point eight billion years ago. The researchers still are awaiting official confirmation of their research. They are careful to call them candidates for now. Lija said it is possible that a few of the objects might not be galaxies, but very large black holes. While some may prove to be smaller, Labe said at least some of them will likely turn out to be huge galaxies. The next year will tell us, he said. One early lesson from Webb is to let go of your expectations and be ready to be surprised. Labe added, "I'm Dan Novak." Teachers often use videos to give students a break from the usual classroom activities. Learners use videos too to improve their listening and speaking skills. In this week's education tips, we look at how one of our videos. Can be the start of a full English lesson. We will look at the video for the big snow, lesson eleven of Let's Learn English Level Two. In this lesson, Anna and Pete are reporting on a snowstorm or blizzard. Anna loves to talk about weather. Pete is unhappy because he is working on a weekend. The video teaches the present perfect. And past perfect verb tenses. In recent workshops with English teachers in Ukraine, VOA Learning English instructors asked the teachers to brainstorm ideas for activities they could create with this video. The teachers came up with about forty ideas. They range from activities centered on grammar to activities that cover the subject of weather. Here are some examples of classroom activities for before, during, and after watching the video. Before watching, students list the words they know for kinds of weather and prepare to listen for weather words in the video. The teacher describes the video's plot. Then students predict what will happen if Pete and Anna must stay at work all weekend. Students talk about their personal experiences with major storms, or describe storms they have read about in books or seen in movies. While watching, listen for weather words in the video and write them down, or circle them on the printed text of the lesson. The teacher stops the video and, with an image showing on the screen, asks students to do an activity. Guess what happens next? Describe what the characters are wearing in the image. Ask questions about what has happened so far. Give an actor in the video advice. Talk about which actor is their favorite. Describe the setting. Describe the feelings of the people in the video. After watching, students summarize the story in writing. Or talk about it in small groups. Students identify problems and solutions in the story. Students act out their favorite scene from the video, or act out the story with a different kind of weather event. Teacher or students write true or false statements about the story to check understanding. Students think of different ways the story could end. Then they write the different ending. And act it out in small groups. Students think of other names for a big storm that might happen where they live. Student groups make lists of supplies they would need in case of a natural disaster: foods, equipment, clothing. Students play a game with a paper snowball. As you can see from this list, there are plenty of ideas for giving students the chance to speak, write. Read and listen, while enjoying a short humorous video. 
If you want to see more ideas, each Let's Learn English video comes with a lesson plan that you can download. For the snowstorm video, one activity sheet asks students to use the present perfect and past perfect tense to think of questions and answers using snow words. Another activity sheet gives students weather information from around the world and asks them to give a weather forecast like the ones you can see on television. We are sure you can think of other ways to use this video in learning or teaching English. Write to us in the comments if you want to share your own ideas. I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Birds bring so many wonderful things to our lives. They have beautiful songs for our ears and beautiful feathers for our eyes. Birds also add to our English expressions. You may have heard the early bird catches the worm. This saying means the person who arrives first is most likely to get what they want. And what about birds of a feather flock together? That means people with the same interests are often together. Well, today we talk about a bird expression that describes being upset or bothering someone. When we upset others, we have ruffled their feathers. For example, if I am often late meeting a friend, that could ruffle her feathers. It could bother her. And if someone lies to me, that will ruffle my feathers. Besides meaning to bother or upset people, this expression has another meaning. It also means that your action shakes things up. We use it to describe an action that changes the status quo or the usual way of doing things. Sometimes we upset more than just one person. In that case, we can say we ruffled a few feathers. For example, if a new work policy is not popular with workers, it will probably ruffle a few or more than a few feathers. In English, we have quite a few expressions that mean something similar. To drive someone up the wall. To get under someone's skin and to get on someone's nerves all mean to bother someone. However, we do not use those expressions to describe changing the usual way of doing things. So, in that sense, ruffling some feathers is different. Word experts say that the use of this expression began in the mid-1800s. It comes from the fact that sometimes birds ruffle their feathers when they are upset. But birds also ruffle their feathers at other times. For example, to keep warm or during mating season. Now let's hear two friends use the expression. The meeting for our ukulele club is going to start in 20 minutes. I brought drinks and some food. And I brought copies of our new rules. Um, I don't think you should hand those out. Why? Well, some members are not going to like them. What do you mean? I mean, these new rules are going to ruffle some feathers. No way. Whose feathers are going to be ruffled? Well, Marjorie for one. Your first new rule is no dogs are permitted during practice. She doesn't go anywhere without her little dog, Binky Boo. Well, maybe we can change that one. And the dress requirement? Do you really think people want to dress in costume for performances? 
It'll make it more fun for the audience. Actually, every one of the new rules is going to ruffle someone's feathers. Okay, I get it. I'll throw them away. The last thing I want to be accused of is being a feather ruffler. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. I'm Deanne Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. Joining us is the presenter of Words and Their Stories, Anna Mateo. Welcome, Anna. Hi, Dan. Happy to join you. So, Anna, why don't you remind our listeners of this week's topic? For this week's Words and Their Stories, I wrote about a bird and feather expression. To ruffle someone's feathers. I live close to a small lake, and whenever I walk my dogs, I see ducks and geese there. I think when I pass the birds with my dogs, I see those feathers ruffle. The expression means to bother or annoy, and I think the dogs bother those ducks and geese just by passing by. They think they own the lake. And the walking path around it. That's right. By the way, when is the last time someone ruffled your feathers? Hmm. Well, now that you mention it, I was running in a race two weeks ago, a five-kilometer race, and with about five hundred meters to go, I passed another runner who was ahead of me most of the way. And I felt quite proud of myself, but then, with about one hundred meters to go, that runner came rushing past me and beat me. That move definitely ruffled my feathers. How about you? When's the last time you ruffled anyone's feathers? I haven't ruffled anyone's feathers for a long time. Well, at least I hope I haven't. Anna, I hope you're right about that. So, this expression has another meaning. Anna, can you tell us more about it? Yes, it can also mean to upset the status quo, or the usual way that things happen. I can see how someone who likes to see things done a certain way. Might get their feathers ruffled if a new person wants things to change. Anna, thanks for joining us and chatting about this interesting English expression. It's always fun to join you. Take care. Thanks, Anna. I really appreciate your time. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English broadcast. Next up, Kelly Jean Kelly. With this episode of America's Presidents, VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about George Washington. He was the first president of the United States. He served from 1789 to 1797. But he had many other accomplishments too. He owned thousands of hectares of land in his home state of Virginia. He was a famous general who led the American colonists to freedom from British rule, and he presided over the convention that created the U.S. Constitution. For Washington, that was enough. He said. He wanted to retire from public service and return home, but the country's new electors had other ideas. They wanted him to move to New York, and invent the American presidency. Washington accepted the job as his duty.
Washington was sworn in as president in 1789. At the time, a truly United States was still just an idea. Americans were unconnected groups. They came from different countries, had different religions, and spoke different languages. For example, a quarter of the people in the state of Pennsylvania spoke only German. Doug Bradburn is the founding director of the Washington Library at Mount Vernon. He says, when Washington took office, the country was fragile. The chances that it would even survive were probably very, very slim. Bradburn explains that Washington had to establish social and political unity. But the Constitution did not say how the president could do that. So, Bradburn says, Washington invented the job for all future presidents. He established a group of advisors called the Cabinet, as well as the nation's official money. He appointed a six-member Supreme Court, and he created the Department of Foreign Affairs, now called the State Department. However, Washington said it was the president's responsibility to set foreign policy. Historian Doug Bradburn explains that Washington established the president not just as a figurehead, but as a decision-maker. But he always used the Constitution as his guide. He wasn't just trying to establish an office and then figure out a way to justify it. He was trying to work with his Constitution. George Washington was born in 1732 in the colony of Virginia. His father died when George was 11 years old. As a boy, he learned reading, writing, and math. Then he worked as a land surveyor in western Virginia. Historian Joseph Ellis points out that Washington did not have a formal education. Instead of going to college, Ellis says, Washington went to war. He fought against the French and Indians as a British army officer. That experience informed Washington's world view. Ellis describes the first president as a realist. At the same time, Washington was a very passionate man with extremely strong emotions. He was known to get angry but he showed his temper to only a few people. Washington not only acted like a great leader, he looked like one. George Washington stood about 1.9 meters tall. That was a head taller than the average man of his time. He was very strong and very graceful. He was known as one of the best horseback riders and best dancers in Virginia. But he had a problem. Bad teeth. Unlike his wife, Martha, who was known for her lovely smile, George Washington began losing his teeth in his twenties. When he was sworn in as president, he had only one tooth left. Washington remains an important figure in the American imagination. Even today, people tell stories about him. One popular story, that he had wooden teeth, is not true. But he did wear dentures. They were made, in part, from hippopotamus ivory. And he did not chop down a cherry tree as a child, and then admit it by saying, I cannot tell a lie. In fact, historian Joseph Ellis says, Washington lied many times. But it is true that as Washington became more famous, his reputation grew. People thought of him as a man who always did the right thing. 
Joseph Ellis says even Washington understood people would look at his writings and judge him. Washington went from being a man to a monument. He was aware of the fact that he had a role to play and that all emerging nations need mythical heroes. Washington became very protective of his personal thoughts. His wife burned most of their letters. Yet, we know a little bit about Washington's thoughts from other writing. One of his regrets, he said, was that he had not done something to end slavery. Like many plantation owners, Washington was a slaveholder. More than 300 enslaved people lived on his property. By the end of his life, Washington opposed slavery. He left a will ordering his survivors to free his slaves after his wife's death. Washington's will became relevant sooner than he might have liked. Three years after he finished his second term as president, Washington fell ill. He had been outside riding his horse on a cold, wet day. When he came home, he complained of a sore throat. Over the next two days, his condition became worse. On December 14, 1799, he died in his bed, surrounded by his wife, enslaved maids, and friends. He was 67. Historian Joseph Ellis says one of the best things about George Washington was his ability to give up power. At the end of the Revolutionary War, General Washington surrendered his sword. And at the end of his administration, President Washington simply returned home. You could trust Washington with power because he was so conspicuously willing to give it up. Doug Bradburn says Washington was the right man at the right time. Bradburn, like many historians, calls George Washington the indispensable man. In other words, Washington was essential to the American experiment in self-government. He made ideas about American freedom real, and he showed that even the president would operate under the rule of law. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you for listening. And thanks to all my VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. We hope you do not ruffle any feathers this week, unless it's for a good reason. In today's program, we heard about images from a powerful space telescope. We learned how to use videos when preparing lessons and facts about George Washington, the famous general who became the reluctant first U.S. president. If you want to keep learning English with stories from around the world, 